Hi. Well, I guess Marzuli made me late. <laughs> I don't know. That, his Fatima thing was really amazing, though. The whole thing with the goddess Diana and all that stuff is just like, I mean, what, I got to see those pictures right off the bat and help analyze them with him. And then he told me about the Diana thing, and I'm going, oh, okay, there you go. And these entities seem to come back to the same spot all the time. It's just, it's just weird. <laughs> so, are you guys ready for believing that miracles can still happen? <laughs> I know how that sounds really cheesy, <laughs> but uh, it's true. I, I have my special thanks to Dan Cressman and the fellowship from Lubbock for this computer that I'm using, and he's going to be really thrilled when I tell him that this saved Gary's presentation tonight, <laughs> which is really cool. Gary's computer died, and he didn't have his password. <laughs> so I couldn't fix it that fast, so I used mine. Also, thanks to Bob and Gary. Uh, for letting me do this. This is like the funnest thing I can think of doing. I just love doing this kind of stuff because I never get to talk about it with, with anybody. The Torah code seemingly is calling, calling out, out the amount of, of people who perished that day before the body count was actually tallied up. The three had been hitchhiking home near the West Bank and we never heard from again. Capture Israelis, massacre Israelis, drug them take some of them back, but no doubt no extort doubt. ransoms or, or kill some of them when they get them back to the territory. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azad at the break of dawn. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America. Darkness is when you don't see things, you don't understand what is going on. Right. How the God tell you what is going on. As religion becomes so steeped in dogma and ritual that we no longer believe that miracles could exist, Okay, I wanted to do this because I've read so much stuff since we came out with our film that people were saying crazy things about the Torah codes. And how many of you have ever heard about the Torah codes? Most of you. Well, that's good. The codes are not a religion. They are not satanic. They are not only for Jewish people. <laughs> They are not a crystal ball to predict the future, and they're not a way to ignore actual biblical prophecy. The codes are based on mathematics. They're found using computer software. They're supernatural in their existence, in my opinion. They're a possible preview of the book of life. And they're proof that the Torah was a gift from God to help us deal with future issues when we were smart enough to discover it. There's also this verse in Proverbs. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So that's what we're trying to do. So <laughs> my friend Rabbi Glazerson tells me, you have to tell them how we met. It was divine. <laughs> and I love my rabbi friends more than you could possibly know. And I, I tear up sometimes talking about them because I can't even believe we have this relationship. It's the weirdest thing. Here I'm a Christian, and they're Orthodox Jews, and I love them all very much. This is how I was pulled into it. And then how the codes work, for those of you who are kind of uncertain how all that, this goes on, <laughs> and some of the best tables, and then the Trump tables, which I'm sure you'll want to see. My introduction to it was I was in Hollywood uh, helping to produce a pilot show, and we were holed up at the Beverly Hills Hotel. That was Merv Griffin's place, and that was in 1998, and this guy came on... I think it was Good Morning America, and it was Michael Drosnan, 
How many have ever heard of him? Lots of you. You guys are so, what a cool audience this is. I just can't get over it. No, really, you also are informed and study this stuff. It's tremendous. So I ran out and bought the book and read it on the plane on the way home because at the time I wasn't living in Hollywood. I was living in Atlanta and I had a company called Z Post. And I was just blown away going, this is crazy. How can this possibly be? But then I stumbled across this verse in Acts. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. And to me that was like, wow, that's a huge clue. The law was given by angels. So now we got a weird supernatural thing going on here. And the, the strange thing about it is that the Torah is singularly the most unusual set of books in the whole Bible. And the Jewish folks that I know almost idolize it. I mean, they'll wrap it in stuff and put a crown on it and, and fall down prostrate to the Torah because they believe it's the word of God. That's what they do. And it, it's still accurate after all these centuries. There's not, a, not a, anything out of place, and now we realize why. So the, how I got pulled into it was a very strange coincidence. I was working on a, uh, a, a rap music show with my friend Lee Cantillon. Now, Lee was, was doing a bunch of different things at the time. And Lee is the son of a guy named Dr. Willard Cantillon. I don't know if you uh, older folks here might remember who he is. He wrote a book, a couple books in the 70s. One of them was called The Day the Dollar Died, and another one was called New Money or None. And Willard was brilliant and a close friend of mine. And so I met Lee back when we were just kids, and we've been best friends ever since. And so he worked on this book called The Words, and it's just the words of Jesus with all the intervening text removed. And I had this guy come into my studio, and this is The Words Project. Uh, it's, it's still available on Amazon, but I don't know if you guys would really like it. <laughs> Most of the church people don't, <laughs> but they don't understand the miracle behind it, and I don't expect them to really understand what happened there, because when we did it, we used Lee's book as the basis for all of the rap that went into this project. And <laughs> at the time, uh, I knew this, this guy, uh, Warren Holden, a uh, big black fellow, and he came into my studio, and we had done some discussions together, and I liked him. And he said, I I've got to bring this guy over that wants to meet you to do a car show. And I said, w what's his name? He said, Big Slice. I said, okay, have him come over. And, and I like working with people that aren't necessarily know the Lord. I, I really enjoy that, because then I can kind of like eventually, you know, share something with them without preaching, work with them and just show them Jesus' love. That's what I think we're supposed to do. So this guy, really big black gentleman with a big smile, six foot four, like as big as a refrigerator, walks into my studio, and I liked him immediately. Just like, this guy is so cool. Then I found out that he was building all of Snoop Dogg's lowrider cars. Those are the whole of the hydraulics and all that stuff. So he told me his whole story and, and how he grew up in Watts and he had his grandmother's house. I said, you got to take me over there. You know, so the next day he picks me up in the Snoop uh, DeVille, <laughs> which was a Cadillac with chinchilla fur seats and diamond studded door panels. And I go, this is just great. <laughs> and so I brought a couple cameras with me and he drives me in there and he's got his walkie talk. He's okay, I'll meet you in the parking lot. And I don't know what we're doing. I, I'm just going with him, and I, I just thought it was an interesting story. And all these kids with white T-shirts meet us in the parking lot in Watts, okay? And we get out of Snoop's car, and, and they treat us like gods. You know, it's like, you guys are like, they're all handing us their CDs. And then I realized all these kids were trying to get out of the hood by writing rap music. 
And it was like eye-opening. So I tell Lee this story, and he goes, well, maybe Big Slice would read the words for us, and we could record him in the studio. And I said, yeah, he might, maybe. So I asked Warren if he would ask Big Slice if he'd read the words. And he said, well, and then he said, um, the guys with um, Bone Thugs and Harmony would probably do a song for you. I said, what? Do you guys know who Bone Thugs and Harmony is? Probably not, right? They've done 30 million albums, 30 million. Their hit song that they won a, a Grammy for, and the only song they've ever won a Grammy for was called The Crossroads, T-H-A, Crossroads, The Crossroads. It, it was a tribute to Easy e who died of AIDS, who got them their start in the music industry, but it's all about dying and going to heaven. And so these hardcore guys that were writing music for Death Row Records wanted to rap the words of Christ. I couldn't say no. How could I? So here's like a little quick demo. And if, if you don't like it, I understand. But I just want you to have the backstory of it because it's pretty, pretty cool. You were put on format where I said be best. The book speaks freedom, get your slaves to the text. That's why my name's perfect and your name's in a wreck. You keep my name in your neck. Music is so powerful right now. They're gonna see these icons that they so used to seeing speak these words. Blessed are you who hear the word of God and follow it. And so people really took to heart um, these teachings. They would become free. It would be very scary. Yeah. We're doing this gospel thing, right? Mm -hmm. From the street. Yeah. You take the words of Jesus Christ. And basically, you just, you know, build your own personal. Yeah, flip them my way. Yeah. I'm living in revelation, nation against nation. Flood in the good and the both my cations. Nigga, little brother, we are under preservation. Every day trying to face temptation. Christ don't understand a thing we do. He just understands love, so he's patient with you. He's the only high that your brain will refuse and make just a fire we need like he gave it to you. Take flight with the things you were given. Read it in a book, it was already written. So I connected with it. It was like it was divine. My soul felt it. Like even right now, I got the chill bumps talking about it. Kill me, Dad! Yeah! Make me be reborn! And all religions, when it comes down to it, it's just that personal relationship you have between you and the Almighty. I mean, when you do what you do and you shine at it, that's God's work right there. The passage out of the book that I used to um, kind of like spark that was the um, end times. We're taking it to the streets. The Words Project. That a little bit of a. <laughs> so we became really good friends with Bone Tux and Harmony, and we're riding around in their tour bus because they asked Lee and I there to be with them as their spiritual protectors. That's what they told us. So we're hanging, and, and all the guys like in the music industry are going, how did you guys do that? They were like dumbfounded. So at the same time that was going on, Lee comes over to my studio. This is what it looked like, the one I had, used to have in Hollywood. It was built in a really ancient building that Charlie Chaplin used to rehearse in with Mabel Norman back in the 20s. And this is the second floor that I redid. The floors were like awful, and we refinished it and everything. Looking out my windows, you could see the Hollywood sign. And so we were doing this project there, and then Lee said, you know, what other documentaries might you want to do? And I said, well, you know, the Bible code really intrigues me. But I said, I don't know any of the rabbis. I don't have any money to do it. I'm already finishing Beat the Drum in and, and this project, and I have no idea how that would ever happen. Well, he ran off for 10 days to um, produce music for Ricky Lee Jones, Chuck E's in Love. You probably remember that tune from a long time ago. And she's done like a dozen albums since then. And so he gets back from that, and his brother Paul was in New York. So he gets on a plane, and the flight's canceled due to bad weather. So he goes two days later, and the, his seat assignment puts him next to this guy, that looks like a rabbi. The guy was Professor Robert Herlich 
from City University in New York, who is the guy that knew all the world experts on the Torah codes. They were his best friends. Lee lands in LaGuardia and, and uh, calls me on his cell phone. He said, hey, Rick, I think you're going to want to talk to this guy. And I'm talking to Professor Herlick. I had nothing to do with this. It was all God. It was just like, I just mentioned it would be cool to do this project. Next thing I know, I'm talking to the guy writing the software to search the Torah. It was weird. So, you know, I actually thought, I knew that TVN had been interested in doing it, and I really wasn't interested in doing something with TVN all that much unless they would help fund this so we could actually do it. And so I called Robert and I said, hey, have you guys got any new codes or any new tables that are really cool that I could pitch to try to raise the money to do this? He goes, and then he floored me. He said, Professor Rips and Rabbi Glazerson will be in Los Angeles tomorrow. Here's their cell phone number. <laughs> now you have to understand, Professor Rips is the guy who is considered the originator of the Torah codes. It worked with uh, Doran Whitstam and Yoav Rosenberg back in the, from 1976 through the 80s to develop the software to search the code. And then towards the end of the 80s, they enlisted Alexander Rotenberg, a graduate of Moscow University, to write the version that does the graphic representation we see today. That's how we got that. So Rips is like a mathematical genius and was a complete atheist, brought up an atheist, lived in, uh, uh, oh, it wasn't Yugoslavia, but he, Czechoslovakia. He grew up there, tried to set himself on fire when the Russians invaded to protest. The horrified onlookers came, rushed up and put the fire out, and they sent him to a psychiatric prison for two years. And then another guy complained that Russia was putting people in jail for no good reason. So they threw that guy who complained into jail and released Rips. And Rips was picked up and sent to Jerusalem. Now, he had no idea what Jerusalem was like. All these guys with weird hats and dreadlocks and, you know, stuff hanging down their pants and like long jackets, like what in the heck? You know, he didn't know what it was. And that's the life of the rabbis there in various levels. And so he thought, well, I, I guess I better study this Torah book and see what this is all about. He'd never done it and everything. And he, he, told, he told me in the interview, which is in that little blue DVD that I have, that he discovered it was a book of miracles. Because it is. Think of all the things that happened in the Torah. We think of miracles as more like stuff that Yeshua did. But really, there was so much crazy stuff that happened in Exodus, the Ark of the Covenant, the ephod that would light up when you'd ask questions to it, you know, just on and on. The story of Joseph and reading people's dreams. I mean, it just goes on. It's just rich in detail with so much stuff. So he, as a scientist and brilliant mathematician, he had to prove that the Torah was, was real, and the only way he could do it was mathematically. So he delved into it and realized it was encoded. And his first clue to that was in 1976, there was a rabbi by the name of Yaniv. And I'll make this brief because I know this is it's late and I should have given everybody chocolate bars. <laughs> 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 but um, Yaniv turned him on to this, the, a guy named Weissmendel who had found this skip letter thing. And so... That's when Professor Rips got together with two other guys and developed some software. And that was uh, kind of a tall, tall order. Then there's another thing called gematria. And gematria is not the same. Gematria is like every Hebrew character has a number. It always has. And they add up. So, I mean, in this particular case, there's stuff that all of these sentences... It says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob added up to 776. Kingdom of David and the world forever, 776. Come back to me and I will come back to you. They all added up to 776. What it meant 
We don't know it. We just thought it was really interesting. But I found that gematria isn't as, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say it's unimportant because then I would make my rabbi friends feel bad. But I think it's, it's cool, but it's not as involved as the Torah codes are. But here's gematria. And this needs some sound, guys. Hey, Max. Hey, Maya. Sorry, put it out. This is so. from the movie Pie. What do you do? <clears throat> um, I work with computers, math. Ma math? What kind of math? N number theory. Research, what? mostly. No way, I work with numbers myself. I mean, not traditional. I work with the Torah. <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> you know, Hebrew's all math. It's all numbers. You know that? Yeah, look. The ancient Jews used Hebrew as their numerical system. Eh? Each letter's a number. Like the Hebrew A, Aleph, it's one. B, Bet, it's two. You understand? But look at this. The numbers are interrelated. Like, take the Hebrew word for father. Av, Aleph, Bet. One, two, equals three. All right? Hebrew word for mother, Aim, Aleph, Mem, one, 40 equals 41. Sum of 3 and 41, 44. All right? Now, Hebrew word for child. All right? Mother, father, child. Yelled. That's 10, 30, and 4. 44. Torah is just a long string of numbers. Some say that it's a code sent to us from God. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's just kid stuff. Check this out, okay? The word for the Garden of Eden, Kadem. Numerical translation, 144. Now, the value of tree of knowledge, all right, in the garden, right? Eitzachayim, 233. 144, 233. Now, you can those take those numbers. numbers. So, the, you know, like the Fibonacci sequence? Fibonacci. Fibonacci's... Um, an Italian mathematician in the 13th century. If you divide 144 into 233, the result approaches um, theta. Theta? Theta. The Greek symbol for the golden ratio, the golden spiral. Wow. I never saw that before. That's like that series you find in nature? Like the face of a sunflower? Wherever the spirals. You see this math everywhere. Mac? <laughs> he couldn't take it. Even, it's in, even in the Torah. So, Rips did a table finding the Fibonacci sequence. And all the numbers are there in a very small table. All stacked up neatly. And so this is the, the idea of equidistant letter sequencing, ELS. And if you look at, at this block of text, our, We've got pretty good projectors here, so I, you should be able to read it. But basically, the text says, this is the form we use for finding codes. And I added letters precisely placed to form a longer example. But the word order appears at the front of each sentence. So basically, when you search the Torah, you're getting like the computer to find a word and it makes a long string and basically makes a spiral of that whole thing and then cuts it down the middle and unfolds it and you're seeing it that way. That's how the computer's doing it. And this is the man who discovered it was Rabbi Weissmandel in the 50s. And this is what he discovered. Basically, just using his finger to count, 
he found the word Torah in the book of Genesis every 50 characters. So then he thought, well, I'll try it in Exodus. Same thing happened in Exodus. This is counting with his fingers, no computers back then. So in the book of Le Leviticus, he thought, well, maybe it's in Leviticus, and he couldn't find it. So then he goes, okay, um, every eight letters then. And he found Hashem, or basically the God with no name. And then in the book of Numbers, he found Torah backwards. And in the book of Deuteronomy, he couldn't find it in every 50 letters. He goes, oh, but that's the book that Moses wrote, so he doesn't get the perfect number of 50. So he'll get 49. And sure enough, the word Torah was in Deuteronomy backwards. So what do you have? You've got Torah, Torah, God, mirror image Torah, mirror image Torah. That's just counting with your finger. It's what's kept me interested in this all this time. People have also said, well, how are they forcing these letters to go sideways and up and down vertical, horizontal, and, and diagonal? And they're not. It's just the way it comes out, and it has to do with resonance. Here's a, a physical example of that. A cadmi plate. It's basically a piece of steel that's attached to a subwoofer and it's vibrated by a sweep oscillator. And they're just putting salts on it. So 345 hertz, you get that pattern. It's all natural. It's, it's in nature. It's the way things work. The Torah codes work just the same way, except they're doing it in software. The size of the ELS means it's going to be horizontal, vertical, backwards, forwards, whatever. You can see how elaborate it gets at higher frequencies. So here are the world experts that I'm going to introduce to you. Professor Eli Yahoo Rips, who I've been talking about, uh, uh, just a sweet, humble, soft-spoken genius. I've been to his apartment in Jerusalem. I've spent a lot of time with him in New York when he was here a few years ago. And he writes me when he's worried about America. He loves America, and he worries about me. <laughs> Thinks it's getting too violent here. Professor Robert Herlich, who is, he's actually a professor of, his, his actual title is Distinguished Professor of Computer Science at City University in New York. What he's currently doing, the last time I talked to him about a month ago, I actually had Gladison in the car with me. He came to visit me in Los Angeles. So we were, I said, let's call up Robert and see what he's doing. So. I can usually never get him on the phone because he's so busy teaching. I said, so what is it you're doing? He said, I'm working with DNA. And I said, oh, we've done quite a bit of that ourselves. What are you doing? And he said, um, well, he said, until about 10 years ago, they only thought that there were 20 amino acids in DNA. And I said, okay. He said, well, we found there's actually 22, the same number of amino acids as our characters in the, in the Hebrew language. And he said... Now we think we can have a different way to find Torah codes using DNA and actually find in-depth information about anybody. And I said, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, a lot of my Jewish friends believe in reincarnation. When they read the passage of Nicodemus, you know, what do I have to do? You must be born again. They go, oh, well, that means that He's being reincarnated. They all think that. I mean, that's just the way they believe. And I'm going, well, not necessarily, but I mean, that's, that's what, what they think. So uh, Professor Herlich believes that the DNA would even show everybody's past lives. I mean, that's, that's how deep into it he is. This is what always intrigues me about the whole orthodoxy. And this is Rabbi Matityal Glazerson. He's done, I don't know, 3,000 tables maybe by now. He writes me every day, sends me new tables all the time. We work together quite often. He's like part of the family. He'll come over to my house and 
raid my refrigerator. <laughs> you know? And, you know, and I really mean it when I say, and I've told other people this, but I really mean it because, you know, I'd be like in the stairway where he can't see me and I'm, I'm tearing up. I told, Lord, you know, it's almost like I've got Elijah walking through my house. I, this is just so cool, you know. <laughs> and, you know, we, we have this really weird relationship. He knows I'm a Christian and he's a, you know, Orthodox Jew, you know, glot kosher. Everything has to be just so. I've actually cooked for him at home, you know, and uh, he'll ask me, what do Christians think about this? And I'll say, what do you think about that? And we have these really deep discussions about stuff I couldn't have with anybody else. I mean, because he's got, he knows all about the Torah, plus he knows all about the ancient Jewish mystical texts, which, which I don't look at as being scripture, but I do believe that God, these are God's chosen people, right? We all believe that. So God has imparted certain information on that maybe the rest of us don't quite get. So I want to know what he knows. I'm really intrigued with it. And it's not like I'm going orthodox or anything like that. I just want to have a better understanding of these guys so I can better relate to them. And if I'm sharing Christ with them, I don't do it in a way that it offends them. That we can stay, you know. But at this point, we're like, He's like part of the family. This is Professor Alexander Rotenberg. He's a graduate of Moscow University. He's just incredibly brilliant. He was the guy that invented the Torah code crossword puzzle of look that we're talking about. He was the guy that did the graphic representation of the codes that we use today. This is Art Levitt. Art Levitt is just really super straight-laced about the codes. If, they, if you do, haven't done them a priori, and if you don't know a p-value for them, then they don't mean anything. They're like ordinary, he said. So he works really close with Rips, and Rips and him get along really great. So I really respect Art's stuff. And, um, but they all have their own uh, way of looking at the Torah and pulling things out of it. Glazerson has this really deep understanding of ancient his Hebrew. Art Levitt looks at it kind of mathematically like Professor Ripps does. Uh, Rotenberg's totally different because he's at like the coding level himself. I mean, all these guys are incredibly brilliant, talented, and I love hanging out with them. So here we go. It's one of my favorite tables. It's beyond coincidence to me. So you have this whole line of text. It says, what is, what is their heart, United States, the abomination under the Lord, and 90 degree angle at the same angle as this, Obama and Hillary. And then right here, the left. And then right here, crossing it, they are defiled. But, but the weird thing is, all this came up under the plain text, an abomination under the Lord, Deuteronomy 17, 1. And they didn't, you know, Glazerson didn't force this table to end up on the plain text that actually said that. It just happened that way. So, you know, and then at the very bottom it says, cursed will be the taker of bribery. And that's also in the plain text. <laughs> the next is one by Art Levitt. His are real simple, clean, and direct, and, and couldn't have been put there by random chance. Saddam will die, hanged, like his brother, all in a tiny little table with just maybe, what, 150 characters? So it's not like stuff scattered all over the page like you see on YouTube, that kind of deal. It's just a tiny little, very precise table. Here's another one. Do you, you guys know who George Norrie is at Coast to Coast AM? Well, George had me on to talk about the Torah codes when we first released the film. And, he, and this guy calls in from, oh, someplace in, in Canada at 10 till 2 a.m. in the morning to ask is the Torah Codes the Book of Life? I said, that's a really good question, and Glazers and I have discussed that. 
And wouldn't it be ironic if we've all been carrying the book of life around with us, going, do, 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 do. And, you know, our, our names in there are not. And so the reason I began wondering if that could be the case is because I asked Glazerson, can you find everybody's name in the Torah? No, we can't. I said, you can't? So that made me really suspicious, like not everybody's name was in the Torah codes. So then when I said that on the air, George goes, I got to know if I'm in it. <laughs> I said, okay, well, we got to take this offline because you're going to have to give me some personal information. I said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow. So George calls me at home and gave me all this info, and I gave it to the rabbis, and I said, look, there's three million people listening to this show. We got to do a table for George Norrie. And I, I don't ask this lightly because I know it's a lot of work. So it took them three weeks, and they did nine tables for me. But this particular one was done by Professor Reps, and it's typically his style. It's a complete sentence. I'm not trying to ignore you guys over there. I can only point at one screen at a time. But basically, they, they understand that George likes the paranormal, okay? So it, it, the whole string right down the middle, the key words for this table say, loves the paranormal, but clear cut. So he's not like crazy. He believes the paranormal's real, and he, he loves dealing with it. That's George, okay? And then Art worked on it too, and, and it found broadcaster right there, radio, crossing the whole deal, and then Nori right next to it. And it was incredible. I printed these out on really big page pages and sent them to George so he'd have them. Here's one that uh, Mati Tia Glazerson keeps looking up my name and pin light <laughs> in the tables. He keeps finding stuff. I don't ask him always to do this, but then when we released the film in, in 5775, he found the keywords, the code will be distributed. And then right under it is my name. And he goes, well, that's really significant because your whole name came up. <laughs> And then off to the right, it says, Son of Jesse. And then over here, Doctrine of Messiah, Glazer, Son, Mati Tiao, his name is in there. And then the cool thing is at the bottom where it says, Your eyes which see the deeds of God. Then this is one he just, just did for me. And this is the key words were Torah code, the code of Messiah, Pinlight, my company name, Ephod, which always comes up in Torah code table sometimes. And it says 5736. 5736 was the year that Rabbi Yaniv uh, gave the information to Professor Rips that caused him to start looking into the Torah codes. 5736 is 1976. And 5775 is when we first released the film. The deeds of God will show to the world. Then this is one that we have actually in the film. It's the Twin Tower Table Massacre, Twins, Towers, Ishmael, Massacre, September 11th, the terror attack. Over the plain text that says, and fell from the people this day about 3,000 men. <laughs> I mean, there's the whole deal right there. And that's in the plain text, not encoded. Then this is one on uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Which is really, really, when I first thought of that, well, okay, it's a little messy, but then I started really getting into it, which sometimes these take some thought to truly understand them. So you see in a row, it says feminine plot, and then right above that, hatred, and Brett's name there, and the other side, the keyword was Kavanaugh, and against. And then the date, 2018, left in Amalek. Amalek was, is always the evil thing. And then the word Semael. Now that was, in Jewish parlance, Semael is an evil angel, the opposite of good. But what's really interesting is the desolation of God, or the left hand, <laughs> which is so... When I read that, I'm going, wow, 
I mean, that's like hidden information that, you know, it's the left that was after Kavanaugh. Here's one that we found because I asked them about it. On the 1st of March, Breitbart was poisoned, will be killed in the plain text, will be killed in 5772, which is uh, 2012. I mean, that's a really clean table. I mean, there it is. Here's one that I thought was, because we were looking up 2012 tables, we thought maybe that something would happen in 2012. But Glazerson nailed it with this table. Change in the world. On the 10th of Tevet, which is the Jewish calendar for December 22nd. If you remember the Mayan calendar and all of that, the change in the world was supposed to happen on December 21st, Right? So this is the day after that in the Hebrew calendar year of 5773 because the dates overlap. We haven't had a new year yet. They had their new year already. So for them, it's 70, 5773. For us, it was 2012 still. And this comes out, change in the world the day after the Mayan calendar was supposed to explode or whatever it was supposed to do. And if you think back, a lot of things have happened since then. I mean, the whole world has gone like, you know, everything has been crazy since that time. So this is probably one of the most famous tables. It's the Twin Towers one that Professor Rips found. And there's a little piece of video here that I did a, a, a long time ago, but it, it's so cool that you have to see it again. Just empty. But when we came to chapter chapter 20 of this book, then all of them suddenly appear in one place. This shows very clearly how everything concentrated in one single place. So what he's saying there, he he had tractor feed paper. He printed out the entire book of numbers from the Torah, all all of it, and just rolled it out there. And all of the codes for the Twin Towers attack ended up in this little tiny space in chapter 20, the Book of Numbers. There they all are right there. The chances of that are 1 in 10 million. Here's the same table in comparing it with a random monkey text. A monkey text is just a randomized text that has the same number of characters. That random text took 4,488 letters to achieve the same results, whereas Rips's table has 234 letters. Here's another table they did. Herlick did this for me as a comparison. Another random text, 7,772 letters it took to achieve those words, and they're all scattered all over the page. So, you know, if you say it, it's in Moby Dick or if it's in War and Peace, it, it doesn't work that way. Now, this is getting into Planet X. I mean, a lot of people, either you love the idea or you hate it or you think maybe something's to it or not, but the Jewish rabbis are totally into it, which surprised me. Because I, I was listening to a lecture yesterday about Tower of Babel here, and it reminded me of one of my early conversations with Glazerson. And I'm rushing because I don't have much time, but. If I go over five minutes, there's no one after me, <laughs> if you aren't falling asleep by then. <laughs> but um, we got a late start. But um, when Glazerson was over at my studio, somehow we got to talking about Noah and the flood and the Tower of Babel. And I'm dying to ask him what he thought of UFOs and all that, and if they were in the codes. But I didn't know him well enough in those days. And then he goes, oh, yes, the Tower of Babel was a launching platform for space vehicles. And I, I said, what? <laughs> and this is a guy that looks like Elijah sitting in my office telling me this. So we know about Nimrod. We know about all that. You know, in the book of Jasser, it says that he wore, and I talked about that. Uh, I mentioned this to Gary Sturman the other day. He said he wrote a 7,000-page article about this idea of, of Nimrod wearing Adam's clothes that God made, and it empowered him. Did you guys know that? I thought that was really intriguing when I read that for the first time. So Glazerson totally believed that the Tower of Babel was 
was something more than just to go up to heaven. It was really going to heaven. Spaceships were landing and stuff like that. It was like a normal deal. So Planet X is a great table in the end of days. And then in the plain text, in yellow, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. An interesting thing is in the Zohar, which is a Jewish mystical text, it says, after 40 days when the pillar rises from earth to heaven in the eyes of the whole world and the Messiah has appeared, a star will rise up on the east, blazing in all colors, and seven other stars will surround that star, and they will wage war on it. So there was a guy, basically all this text below is talking about, there was a man who claimed he was the Messiah years ago. And the Jews didn't believe them because they didn't have the planet in the sky that's predicted in the Zohar. So without that, they knew the guy was a fake. I mean, that's pretty interesting. What does Jesus say? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. So before Jesus comes back, there's a sign that appears in heaven. And it, it, it's logical that there's some kind of interplanetary event that happens that just wakes everybody up. Of course, in, the, in Isaiah 13 and in Isaiah 24 and in Malachi 4, there's all of these things that say, and the earth will be turned upside down. There won't be a branch or a root left to any of them. The world will be, you know, God will completely clean off the face of the earth. I mean, it's like there's ma major things happening, and he couldn't fix the earth this time by putting water on it because, it, no, it would be uninhabitable because of radiation. You know, we got hundreds of nuclear power plants that would all flood, and you know, it would just be unrecoverable. So he's doing it with fire this time. Then this is from my friend um, Gil Broussard, who believes that Planet X has come through the system more than once. And if you look at his research here, like, uh, oh, Venus, 2,500% increase in brightness. Jupiter, 200% increase in brightness. Um, Uranus, big change in brightness, increased global cloud activity. Pluto, 300% increase in atmospheric pressure. The moon is growing in atmosphere. This is... I mean, it's just like all this stuff's happening and, and all of the, the government's telling us about global warming, but they don't tell you that it's happening throughout the solar system. It's not us doing it. There's something affecting all the planets in our solar system currently. And if you go out and look at Venus, you go, wow, it's really bright. Have you noticed that? It's really bright. Wow, so I just So the mainstream online. media... It's now it's into Planet X. Thing. This it like shocked me. Gil sent me this clip, and I thought, Twitter, you got to see it. This Instagram is like a Facebook talent show, okay? So she's about to introduce this group from the Dominican Marty. Republic, All right, so and the kid is awesome that's performing in this, but you're not going to believe what happens at the end. I was just like, you got to be joking. Just like this dance crew from the Dominican Republic is doing. It's Da Republic.
thought that was incredible. In um, Michael Drosnan's book, released in 1997, on page 155, it says, Comet, it will be crumbled, I will tear to pieces, 2012. Well, he wrote this many years before 2012. No one knew there was going to be a comet in the sky in 2012. I asked, um, I sent it to Glazerson. I said, can you check this out and see if this table is accurate? Because Drosnan taught himself Hebrew, and I, I trust Glazerson more. So Glazerson also showed it to Rotenberg. So up at the top it says Elenin. Remember, it was common Elenin. Will break, broken, Nibiru, to be finished in 5772. And down at the bottom, really ominously, it says, in the plain text, in the end of days. <laughs> so then this came out in space.com, October 2011, because remember, our calendar is off from theirs. Doomsday Comet, Elenin zips by Earth in pieces. And that comet was on a, a, it was supposed to come in front of the Earth with an ejecta so big that it would block out the sun for three days. Everybody was saying that. I thought, well, that's going to be interesting when that happens. And it was like a freight train, and we were like going like that. It wasn't going to hit us, but we would be affected by its tail. And it was, it was broke to pieces, just like Drosnan's table said in 1997. We didn't know there was a comet in 2012 going to happen. Here's another thing, a Torah scroll in Mumbai, India, when they went in and, and the terrorists like machine gunned everything in the building, this Torah was torn. And so they did a Torah code about Mumbai and all of the codes they found fit into the hole in the space where the bullets went through the Torah. Same exact passage, everything. And here's uh, one of Rip's tables, and then we'll do Trump. Destruction I will name you, cursed is bin Laden, and revenge belongs to the Messiah. It's an enormous, enormous sentence with all the same skip. All right, the Trump codes. Now, you have to understand, these codes were found before Trump was elected. Will Trump will cancel the agreement with Iran. Iran is at the top of the page, and the word Cyrus appears. Trump, Cyrus, Donald, Iyar, that's the Hebrew calendar uh, month for when he was elected. Here's another one. Trump, Donald, lover of Israel, U.S., will be elected 5777, which is 2017, when he was inaugurated. The president, chess fan, elected November 8th, the second month Hebrew calendar. In the plain text, it says that. Here's another one. Donald, United States, Cyrus, president, chess fan. So the interesting thing about the Cyrus thing, Donald Trump is the 45th president. In Isaiah chapter 45, it says, thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. It's just the creepiest thing. Whose right hand I have held so to subdue the nations before him and to lose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you. And then the Trump codes, gematria for Donald Trump and the Torah code, uh, the, uh, when he attended the Paris conference, the words Paris conference, gematria is 777. The date of the Trump inauguration was 1-2017. Trump's birth was 6-14-46. This is 70 years, seven months, and seven days from his birth, 777. The Hebrew year that he was inaugurated was 5777. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And then just recently, here we have Kanye West hugging Trump in the Oval Office and just inflaming the Democrats. <laughs> and when I first saw this, I teared up. I go, it's like, it's like the words project. It reminded me of that. 
Like, this is the kind of stuff that would happen to us. It's just amazing to me. And I don't care if Connie's half crazy. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, you just got to overlook that stuff. All right, now here's the dangerous codes that, that Rips found. He didn't even want me to show this to people at first. I said, well, we already know. It says, D. Trump, the name of his assassin, president. So Glazerson happened to be in L.A., and I said, hey, we got to find the name of the assassin in this table somehow. So he came over to my house and, and worked on it, and I put it up on my monitor, and we both looked at it. And he came up with this table. So it has the same things Rips found, D. Trump, name of the murderer. And underneath it said Michael. I go, okay, who's that? So then we had to figure, oh, there was this guy named Michael Sanford in Las Vegas that grabbed the security guy's pistol and tried to shoot Trump. Remember that? There he is. Michael Sanford arrested. And he was in the Torico table. So now he's jailed over a plan to shoot Donald Trump. But then on top of that, we got all these crazy people, you know, rape Melania, uh, Kathy Griffin, who's totally, you know, lost it. It's just beyond anything I've ever seen in my life, what's happening. So this is really something that, the way that this ended, I ended up getting this table, this is Professor Rips again who always says, astonishing work, astonishing. I was on the Alex Jones website, and down close in the bottom it said, um, FBI string link, and I don't know, what's this? And I click on it, and it was like an archive chat room discussion with a cloaked FBI agent that anybody could ask him anything they wanted to ask him. And so I started reading it, and I'm going, Oh my gosh, so he was talking about CF, the Clinton Foundation, 200 people involved in total, you know, corruption. It was so much that he didn't even know exactly how to tackle it. This was before Trump was elected, okay? So since, since Rips had sent me this, this really beautiful letter of worrying about America and, and thinking that our news media had become Pravda, because that's what he knew, I sent him that, that link. I said, this is kind of interesting. You might find this fascinating, what this FBI agent said. Two days later, he sends me back some of the most profound tables I've ever seen in my life from the Torah. I can't even understand how he came up with this, but this particular one said, Hillary Foundation really corrupted. And it's all with the same skip I mean, it's just, it's incredible, but then there's another one. If, if Hillary's president cursed like death. Now, I, he's never sent me anything even remotely similar to this. The Here's Comey the covers one. up table, yeah, 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 that's guess. really, really yeah. incredible. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, you see, so therefore you see the importance of this cause you see so many wells related, you understand? When Professor Ripp sent me the table on Comey and Hillary, I thought it was a good table. Here were parallel rows of sentences all describing what happened, a news item that we're all familiar with. But I was astonished when I began to study the skips that made up this table. It went well beyond anything I'd ever seen before. Here we have Comey covers up with a skip of 513 characters. Then over one line in parallel with it is for the mail, also with the same skip of 513. Then above these two lines and printed horizontally with a skip of only two characters is the word Hillary. The final cluster is the most amazing. Two sentences come together on their own, on the same line, each with a skip of the same 513 characters. The sentences making use by their foundation in all, there is a complete story here. Comey covers up for the male, making use by their foundation. Sharing these same characters and splayed out over those sentences about the foundation, in 3D if you will, is the word servers. Compact beyond belief, but then I had to gasp when I realized that the word servers 
had a skip of 1,539 characters. If you multiply 513, the size of the skip for the other sentences, by three, you get 1,539 characters. So, I, I try to understand the complexity of this with me for a moment. You've got all of these sentences with the same ELS, 513, running through a text that's talking about Joseph or something. I don't know what that went over, which part of the Bible, and telling you a whole different story. And all of the sentences have the same skip, the same skip, and they're all side by side. I've never seen anything like that ever before. I don't understand. So it's intentional. It was a little message in there for people who believe in Bible prophecy that God already knew about the whole situation and said, well, here you go. It's just, you know, I'm serving it up to you in the code so you can read it for yourself, those that will take the time to do it. So do we have prophets today? Can we expect any insights from other people? Could God still anoint certain people with that gift? So what, so that years before something happens, we'll know what to expect. I have one last thing to, sh to share with you. In the highest court in the land, the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, two shall step down for the embarrassment of what shall take place. But I wish to place in the highest court in the land righteousness. And they shall attempt to put others in to endeavor, to reach their endeavors. But God says, hear me tonight. Hear me today. I have this whole thing planned out. Now, I think that's rather interesting with the whole thing with Kavanaugh, especially since Kim Clement, who's now dead, predicted this in 2014, four years ago. I mean, it sounds like the news. According to my will, for it is now time for me to restore the fortunes of Zion, the fortunes to those that had it once. You are going to get it back. This is my promise, says the Lord of hosts. Give him a shot. And the Spirit of God made me look at him, and he said, this man will throttle the enemies of Israel. This man will throttle the enemies of the West. And there are highly embarrassing moments that are about to occur for many, many politicians in this nation. There will be a shaking amongst the de Democrats in the upcoming elections, but unsettling for the Republicans. Why is, why is God doing this? For God said, I am dissatisfied with what emerges from both parties. They shall come when this new one arises, my David, that I have set aside for this nation. A man of prayer, a man of choice words, not a man who is verbose, who has verbosity, who speaks too much. They will even say, this man is not speaking enough. But God says, I have set him aside. They will shout, impeach, impeach. But this shall not happen. And then God says, highly embarrassing moments when another Snowden arises. I have said I will bring this nation to its knees. And God said, you have been humbled. And yet some more. And then you shall hear the sounds of great victory. For where are the people gathered? Where are my people gathered? Where is the sound of unity from my people? How do we kill the giant of death? How do we kill the giant of socialism? How do we kill the giant of human secularism? I have placed that man amongst you. These that shall reject him shall be shocked at how he takes the giant down. Now hear me please. The giant of death, the giant, the giants that have come, the brothers 
of Goliath stand in glee watching America we will cripple you you will lose your credit but God said watch I said 20,000 look not to Wall Street however observe and they shall say what is your plan for this this giant and he will take a simple stone remember the name and he will hold it up and they will laugh at him but the plan is so brilliant says the Lord it could only have been given by me and God says once you recognize the man that I have raised up pray for the enemy will do everything in his power to put a witch in the White House did anybody hear what he just said for Jezebel has chased away the prophets and even Elijah come on now I have said go back for this shall be dismantled so that there will be no more corruption in the White House says the Spirit <laughs> so uh, you had to see that I cut out some of it to, for shorter so we didn't have time and I'm already over but thank you very much <laughs>